as pointed out in Ein Leben für das Leben, nuclear policies globally, let alone in the United States, derive from American militarism and the role of the Pentagon in shaping US foreign policy. Never before in the human history has any nation possessed such military might. This is reflected in the United States military budget. We are spending $22,000 every second on the military. During the brief time I've been allotted to speak here, the United States will spend $33 million. In the next 15 minutes, the United States will spend $33 million on the military. In fact, the United Sp States spends $100 per global inhabitant. By contrast, the World Health Organization and all the United Nations agencies that address humanitarian needs spend 30-fold less, or $3 per person, as contrasted to $100. $100 for killing, for mass murder, for, we, we keep on talking of war, but war is invariably state-organized terrorism. That we are spending 30 times as much. And what is interesting to me, that neither the American peace movement I can't speak for others, has ever addressed the question of the Pentagon. It's a curious thing that deserves discussion. No peace movements in America have raised the issue. When the budget comes up in Congress, it's voted like in the Soviet Union, or like in the Reichstag, Sieg Heil. Everybody votes in unison for the budget. At a time when there are enormous needs in the United States, American bases pepper the globe. There are 750 American bases. In a prior age, the expansion of empire would be counted in the number of lands colonized. American version of the colony is the military base. The Pentagon currently has 750 such bases throughout the world. What is interesting to me is we have developed commands. We have a Latin American command, we have an Asian command, a Middle East command, and now, just recently, we have established an African, CENTCOM. But interestingly enough, no African country wanted to have its headquarters. You know where they are now? Here in Germany. You people have the command to invade, fight Africa right here in Germany. I think it's in Dusseldorf. That's the CENTCOM for Africa. <clears throat> to dominate the oceans and the seas of the world, the Pentagon has created 11 naval task forces built around aircraft carriers. A single such task force can take on any nation in the world. The United States has now a space command to dominate space. And a cyberspace command has just been developed, so if necessary, it will invade your personal computers. Notwithstanding this formidable might, the Pentagon holds firmly to the view that nuclear weapons have a legitimate role in, military, in its military posture. Today, the United States faces enormous economic crisis at home with prodigious unmet social needs and no significant antagonist abroad. Nonetheless, and it pains me to say that. Obama's Democratic Party supports this awesome military machine and justifies the imperatives. It justifies it on the imperatives of fighting terrorism, 
which is a police action. The British did not bomb Belfast because they were terrorists. You didn't bomb wherever the bottom line of brigade was. You didn't bomb that city. The Italians didn't bomb Milan because they had terrorists. This is absolutely perverse, and nobody raises a cry about it. Yes, we got to have our troops in Afghanistan to fight terrorism. This is complete perversity. Now, as of this month, it appears that President Obama, like every president before him, will bow to the pressures of the military industrial complex that President Eisenhower warned about in his farewell address in 1959. The, regrettably, there is much evidence that Obama is capitulating to these mighty forces in the United States. He has increased, one of his first acts in office was to increase the bloated Pentagon budget. He's expanding military operations in Afghanistan. He's supporting the nefarious CIA extradition policies. He's maintaining Robert Gates, the Bush Secretary of Defense, as his Secretary of Defense, signaling to the power brokers that the needs of empire will not be compromised. Is this then the end of the story? Do I come to Germany like some Cassandra to bring vow and lack of hope and pessimism? No, there is one vital lesson in the book, Ein Leben für das Leben, suggesting a far more optimistic viewpoint. IPPNW was founded during the Reagan era at the time of the most intense arms race ever in the history of humankind. We and the Russians had 16,000 megatons of nuclear destructiveness. Now, this is incomprehensible. To give you a frame of reference, I always use World War II. In World War II, that was global in its outreach, 50 million casualties. How, much, how many megatons were used? How many equivalent to megaton? 11. And we possess 16,000. Enough to kill everyone alive 20 times. Now, the IPPNW, which did not exist, as Barbara indicated, in a mere brief period of time, began to play a role in the struggle against nuclearism. The story is a formidable lesson for today. We inspired a worldwide movement. The Reagan administration was totally hostile to us. When we wrote to them, they would never answer any of our letters, telephone calls, telegrams, whatever. However, in 1983, at the very Congress that Barbara spoke about in Amsterdam, I was called out, I was chairing a plenary session, I was called out by no less than the United States ambassador to Holland, and he says, Dr. Laun, here's a telegram of greeting from the President of the United States, would you read it? Now, the telegram said, nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. To which Reagan added the soothing words, quote, to those who protest against nuclear war, I can only say, I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs>